6. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. We've gathered today as God's people to do one thing, and that is worship our great God, who is Lord over all, Lord of the heavens and the earth. Let us sing to him this morning. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your you are great. Father, we do. We pour out our praise to you this morning and proclaim you how great you are. Father, hear this old hymn So we sing it to you from the depths of our souls this morning. Indeed, because of your son Jesus, 
and what he's done for us, we proclaim how great thou art.
God's people said. Amen. 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 Gracious Father, Lord, we come to you today and we confess your greatness. We want to ascribe the worth due your holy name. Father, you are beyond anything that we can imagine and we are humbled that you love us so much. That you would reveal yourself to us by sending your one and only son to die on the cross for our sins and then raising him victoriously from the grave that he might have everlasting life. I pray, Father, that today as we come to this time of offering that we'd be faithful in giving, mindful of the cause, to spread the loving grace of God around the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. a journey we walk by faith and there'll always be the mountains in our way but right here in this moment may our strength be renewed as we recall what God has done and how we've seen him
This time we're going to just uh, take some time in our service to uh, thank and to pray for uh, those serving as uh, first responders. Uh, so uh, while, while we're kind of getting set up for that, if uh, first responders, if you are in the room, we invite you to come, if you would, to the front. Uh, I promise we won't do anything weird. Uh, you, you can uh, just come to the front, if you would, and stand before us, and we would love just to be able to pray for you and, uh, and to thank God for you. But uh, if you would, just come on down, stand across the front. Yeah. And you may be seated. We, we haven't even got started yet, but, uh, <laughs> but that's good. I'm, gl- I'm glad to see that. That's great. Um, so, you know, this uh, past couple of weeks, of course, uh, 9-11 and uh, the media shows a lot of images on television screen. And, and, of course, as I'm watching this, we're thankful for what happened on that day in a particular area in our country. Uh, but the more I watched that, I thought, you know, I know maybe not to necessarily that magnitude of the tall towers, but I know uh, to a certain extent every single week uh, they risk uh, their lives, they sacrifice a lot to keep a community going the way that it does. And and we take a lot of it for granted. We don't see a lot because the media don't necessarily follow them around to see everything that they do. Uh, But I know that I've got people in our congregation that suffer from PTSD and a number of other things that's because of stuff that they did in this line of work. And so I know it's, it's a risk. I know it's a sacrifice. And they need to be thanked. Uh, they, need to be, uh, they need to know that they have people here praying for them, that care about them, that know that what they're doing really does make a difference. And that's in part what a church is for, uh, to look at these areas in society and say, hey, we're here for you, we're praying for you, how can we continue to encourage you? And, and that's really what today is about, to honor them, to thank them, as, as we already did just naturally, and that's good, but to let them know that we're here to pray for them. So here's what I want to do. I want, we, we've got Bradley, and he's going to come and he's going to start a prayer uh, for our first responders. I'm going to, midway through, kind of tag in and, and finish uh, that time of prayer. But here's what I want us as a church to do. I just want whoever feels led to come and stand around uh, one of these uh, brave men and women down here and just maybe put your hand on their shoulder uh, and uh, just pray with us as we pray for them. And uh, just let them know that we're here to encourage them and continue to pray for them. So if we could, whoever feels led to do that, come on down at this time. And Bradley, once everybody kind of gets settled, if you would, start us in that prayer. And then we'll just have a time of prayer for them. If you will bow with me. Thank you, God, for this day that uh, you've, you've brought us all here together, Lord. And I just uh, thank you for these men that stand uh, in, front, in front of us, Lord. And I just I pray that uh, your hand of protection be over them as they go out. And I pray that uh, your, your belt of truth hold them together, Lord, that uh, the gospel guide them and that uh, your, their faith uh, be a shield out in front of them, Lord. And I pray that uh, your spirit uh, leads them as they go out and I pray that uh, you keep them uh, safe as they go out each day um, into this this world that uh, is broken and I pray that um, they realize that uh, the things that they do are, are of a greater good Lord and that um, you be glorified in it all and I pray that they see your glory in it all. It's your name we pray. Gracious Father Lord I just pray today for these brave men and women who stand here before us and I pray, Father, that uh, as we gather around them today, that they would know that this, uh, this is what's going on all the time as we pray for uh, the men and women who protect us, who serve, uh, who put out fires, who do so many things that we don't see on a regular basis. Uh, Father, we're thankful for them. And they, they deal with the brokenness and the fallenness in this world on a regular basis, and they have to see a lot of things that, that I don't have to see, that many of us don't have to see, and they do so because they care about this community and because they care about uh, making 
life better for uh, the people in this area. And so, Father, I pray your richest of blessings upon them. Uh, Those who might be struggling with PTSD or struggling with depression or whatever they might be struggling with, Father, I pray that they would know that uh, there are people around them to encourage them and that you give us hope. You provide to us the meaning for life and to know that our works in this life really do matter. And so, Father, I pray for your grace to be upon them that they would know the immeasurable love of Christ and that they would experience that and feel that right now even as we gather around them. But, Father, I pray for your healing hand on any who might be suffering with PTSD or depression or any uh, kind of struggle they might be going through at home. I pray, Father, that they would know uh, that they have a Father in heaven who loves them and cares about them and who has the power to overcome all of that. And so, God, I pray for healing. I pray you'd anoint them for your service. And Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Y'all can go be seated. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. me 
has been satisfied he will hold me fast race with him to endless life he will hold me fast till our faith is hard to sign when he comes at last he will hold me seated for a moment. Even when our love grows cold, the song says he loves us fast. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And even on those days, even during that time, Christ holds us fast. Christ is with us. He cares about us. Immeasurably so. Think of the most loving, kind person you've ever been around. Christ is, that's a taste of what he's like, but he's so far beyond even that. Christ will hold us fast. I want to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. The name of the series is Why Church Matters. And it's kind of piggybacking on the back of our last series, Apologia. And we basically looked at the fact that there is meaning to life, that our works really do matter, that what we do in this life really does matter. And so now we're looking to church and see why church matters. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, if you would please stand in honor. Of God's Word. And he says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Gracious Father, I pray today that as we look into what the church does, what does the church do? I pray, Father, that we would see the importance of our work, of our calling. And I pray, Father, that today that you would help us kind of understand our place in all of this and what a healthy church is supposed to look like. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to make a very simple argument, and that is that a healthy church glorifies God A healthy church glorifies God by engaging in five core ministries. 
A healthy church glorifies God by engaging in five core ministries. But I want to start by talking about what it means when we say glorify God, because we say that a lot, and we just kind of throw that out there because it sounds so good that the chief end of man is uh, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But I wonder if it would do us good to stop for a moment and really look at what it actually means to say that we are here to glorify God, because I really do believe that's the reason the church exists, and I believe that that is why you have breath in your lungs, you have a heartbeat, that is why you exist, ultimately, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But what do we mean when we say glorify God? So before we get into these five core ministries of the church, let's say a word about that proposition, a healthy church glorifies God. Um, and one might even look, let's, let's take a look at our mission statement uh, as a church this morning. This is our mission, to show the world the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. Well, uh, you look at that and you say, well, you know, that doesn't actually say the word glorify God, so maybe do we need to edit it or something like that? What does it mean again to glorify God? We're told in Ephesians chapter 1 that God created us, and listen to this, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. That we might be for the praise of His glory. Glory. Now let's just kind of imagine for a moment, and don't imagine too long because it, it would be quite concerning. Let's imagine for a moment that you're not a Christian and you're listening to this message. So let's kind of put your uh, Bible cap over to the side for just a moment, your Christian cap over to the side. Don't put it too far away. You're going to want to grab it here in just a minute. But um, wouldn't it be selfish of God to create billions of human beings just to praise Him just to inflate his ego and give him applause. Wouldn't that be selfish of God to think that way and to create the world in that way? And that's why I think it's so important for us to understand what glorify means. In 1 Samuel 4.18, it's got an interesting verse that one might read at first and not think that it has anything to do with uh, glorifying God. And um, let me just read it to you. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Verse 18. First um, Samuel chapter 4, verse 18, unless I put down the wrong First Samuel, because that really doesn't look like the first Samuel I was looking for. Um, first Samuel 4:18. No, I think I did put down the wrong one. In fact, I think I put down the whole wrong book. So, but, but the good news is <laughs> the good news is I remember what the verse says. <laughs> That happens from time to time. Um, so in uh, the story of uh, Eli, you remember the story of Eli in the Bible. And, and uh, the way that he died, it says that he died. And it says this word about Eli that he was heavy. And you read that verse and you read that verse heavy and you think, well, that didn't have anything to do with glory. But interestingly enough, in that verse, it uses the same word that's used for glory, and it just means mass. It means weight. It's talking about what something is. I love this uh, explanation from Michael Reeves, perhaps my favorite book, uh, Delighting in the Trinity. He says, um, oh, well, good, he's got the, the verse in here. Uh, <laughs> imagine that. Uh, he says, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of the gate. It says his neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man, and heavy, and that word for heavy is the same word for glory. So he says this. He says, so the glory of something is its mass, its bulk, its worth, what makes it up, what it's all about, indeed, what makes it itself. Perhaps Eli's glory was his stomach. Someone else's glory might be his or her brains or their job or looks, if that is what they most treasure. The glory of a man who lives for money is money. And so... The psalmist says, do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor or the glory of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His glory will not descend with him. So the lesson is to have instead of a glory that will go through, to, to have a glory that will go through death with you. So the psalmist says, but God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. So when we talk about glorifying God, 
What we're talking about is we're talking about recognizing God for who He is. We're talking about just as the psalmist later says, I believe in Psalm 29 too, ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. We are looking at God and we are saying what is true of God. We are honoring God for who He truly is. And my biggest problem and your biggest problem is that we fall short of the glory of God. He is the target. When we talk about sin, what what is sin? Sin just means that we're missing that mark. That's literally what sin is, missing the mark. Our eyes, our heart, our treasure is found in something else, ultimately, primarily, more than God. But you were created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You are created to honor God for who He truly is. And guess what? That's why the church exists. That's why we are here. We are here as a beacon, as a light in this community to constantly turn up praise to God, to point people to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to exalt the ultimate reality above everything else. That's why the church is here. That's why it's so critical that churches do their job that we do our ministries faithfully and correctly, that's why we're here. So we're going to look at these five ministries today of the church, five core ministries. And I want to talk about how each and every one of these um, in some way reveals the nature of God. You say, well, let's go back to this mission statement for just a minute. Showing Jesus. If glorifying God is recognizing God for who He is, and showing Him for who He is, then that's intrinsic to what it means to show Jesus because Jesus is the Word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. He is the one who points us to who God is. If you have seen Him, you have seen God. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, what I like to call the definitive Southern Baptist national verse of the Bible, it says... Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Now, we do real good in the eating and drinking part, right? We're like, praise God, let's obey that command, right? We're, <laughs> we're about to obey that command here in just a little bit, right? It's, it's down there right now. I'm the only thing standing between you and some good brisket. But fortunately, we're looking at Scripture. We're talking about the bread of life. Our goal today is to glorify God as a church. What does that look like? Let's look at core ministry number one. Excuse me, number one, teaching. Teaching, it says in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is the mission of the church? The great commission is given by Jesus is that we go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Disciple literally is a student, a learner. That's what the word means. That's why it wasn't just a happy coincidence that Jesus was called rabbi and teacher just about as much as anything else. It's because that's what he was doing. He was teaching. He was discipling. He was making disciples. And they followed him all along the ancient Galilean countryside. And they were conforming to his teaching. In the King James Version, it says, teach all nations. Rather than make disciples, it says, teach all nations. The way that we make disciples is through teaching. That's what Jesus did. That's what we're supposed to be doing today. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They did that because that's what the apostles devoted themselves to, to teaching others, to the teachings of Jesus. The importance of teaching in the life of the church can't be really overestimated. Um, The Bible talks about how elders must be able to teach. Pastors, overseers, Elders must be able to teach. You know, it's interesting, uh, in discussion about the qualifications for elders, it doesn't really talk a whole lot about ability. And that's why I can be a pastor probably. But it, it, talks, more, it talks more about who we're supposed to be. But it does line out just one or two abilities, and that's one of them. You've got to be able to teach the Word of God. Why? Because it's so critical to the life of of a church. In fact, the term pastor in Ephesians 4 verse 11 is joined together to the word for teacher. In Colossians chapter 3:16 it says, 
that collectively we are to teach and admonish one another. So in other words, it's important to, uh, to do what I do, to function the way that I function, to be able to teach the Word. But guess what? This is an activity that should be intrinsic to the life of the church. You should be teaching and admonishing one another. That should be going on in your own life. You should be someone who is being discipled and someone who is making disciples by teaching. That's what you're supposed to be. It's not just my job. It's the job of every person here. It's something that we're all supposed to be involved in. Why are you here this morning? Why are you listening to what I'm saying? Some of you might be wondering, I don't know why right now. But, but why, why are you doing that? The whole point of teaching in the Bible was that, so that you would go out and teach. So that you would take that content of the apostles' teaching and give that to someone else. Who are you giving it to? Are you giving it to your kids, to your family? Are you giving it to anybody at work? Are you giving it to any of your friends? Or are you just taking it and eating it, devouring it, and then moving on? You're supposed to be taking this tradition, this gospel tradition, and giving it over to others. It's the job of all of us. So the chief end of teaching ultimately is to glorify God. In teaching truth, a church is revealing the nature and character of God because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit says He is the Spirit of truth in John 16, 13. The church is to be the pillar and foundation of truth, 1 Timothy 3, 15. Not the media. And we should all praise God for that. They're not the pillar of truth. Neither is the government, for that matter. So they can kind of do, they, they can do what they do, But we are to be the pillar and the foundation of truth, which is why it is so critical that when churches gather together in their life groups and their worship services, that we have an anchor. We say that the Bible is authoritative, and we say that because God is authoritative, and He has uh, communicated His authority to us through His written Word. And that's why we submit to it. That's why we teach it. That's why we're trying to conform to it, because it's the Word of God. Of God, and there should be for all of us this progression in maturity. Don't come today and sit where you are and leave the same. We are here to change, to be transformed, to be conformed to the image of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Core ministry number two, fellowship. Back over in Acts, it says not only that that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, but it says they devoted themselves to the fellowship. It says, all believers were together and had everything in common. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Sounds to me like it wasn't just something they set aside an hour or two on a Sunday and they gathered together and they did it there. It sounds like this was an ongoing relationship. This was a community. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, God said that something is not good. Think about that for a moment. We're in paradise God says something's not good. What was not good was not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Now, there might be a number of uh, more humorous reasons that would go along with that, but the reality is we are created for community. You are built for community. I just saw a TED Talk about a year or so ago, and all this research for decades and decades have gone into the fact that uh, a person's happiness and fulfillment in life is based primarily on their relationships, the closeness and quality of their relationships with other people. For me, that's scientific evidence for exactly what the Bible says, that we're created for community. It's not good for us to be alone. It doesn't work that way. You're not intended to work that way. You're intended to gather together as a church and have people pray with you and for you, to rejoice with you when you rejoice, to grieve with you when you grieve, because guess what? This is an imperfect community. You've got struggles. I've got struggles. We've all got struggles. And how encouraging is it when you're going through that valley to know that you're not going through it alone? You know, there's people walking with you through that that want you to get to the other side because God knows there's plenty of people out in the world that want to stop you dead in your tracks in that valley. The church pushes you through it. 
Because the church is the body of Christ. This is God's means in many ways to push us through those valleys in life. When we dwell in loving community, we reflect the essence of who God is. Our question earlier today was that God is Trinity. And I like to say that God has existed from eternity as a father loving his son through the Holy Spirit. I've said to you before that God is love. But the only way that we can say that God is love is precisely because we can say that God is Trinity. A father loving his son in the spirit for all eternity. One being, three persons. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. So God himself exists in fellowship, exists in community. The church is to be a light to the world of the community that they have in heaven. Read Revelation sometime. Look at it. See the joy. See the power of that community up there. Revelation 7, Revelation 4 and 5. Just read those and just look at this community gathered around the throne, worshiping God to the fullest. They are fulfilled. And that heaven reality should take place here. It should radiate from the life of this church so that people experience the love of God, whereas teaching moves us towards God by deepening our understanding of God. That is, the more you know about God, the better equipped you are to love God. Fellowship moves us toward God by giving us the experience of heavenly love, of divine love. Our church consists of a called out people who are to dwell in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We are to be unified even if we are diverse. So we have different socioeconomic backgrounds, different races, ethnicities represented here. We've got uh, maybe some Republicans and maybe some Democrats here. I don't know. We've got some people with different political backgrounds. We've got all kinds of different people here. And the beauty of it is that we sit together and we sing songs together. We worship God together. We come together around the Word together. And the world needs to see this. The world has got to see this. This carries weight to it. It's supposed to be this way. When you get to heaven, there's going to be some folks there who have a much different background, much different earthly background than you did. And the beauty of it is you're going to be there and you're going to dwell in perfect unity together for all eternity. And that heavenly reality should be foreshadowed in the life of a church. We are to be called out. We are in the world. We are not of the world, which brings us to our next core ministry, worship. Worship. It says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. They continued to meet together in the temple courts, praising God. This was the life of the early church. I like a quote from Mark Twain. He says, you know, a man who carries a cat by the tail... Learn something he can learn in no other way. (laughs) So I could give you a lecture on what it's like to carry a cat by the tail. I could have ten bullet points. I could have slides. We could exhaust a day me lecturing you on what it's like to carry a cat by the tail. By the way, I've never tried, but I could do that, right? We could have books about it, but at the end of the day, there's no substitute for you just going out there and grabbing a cat by the tail, picking it up, and seeing what happens. A little project for you this week. Don't, don't do that, okay? <laughs> don't do that. Likewise, a man, listen to this though, a man who experiences the attributes of the true God in Christian community learns something he can learn in no other way. In true spirit-driven fellowship, we are experiencing God. There's a weight to this message that I'm preaching when people gather around and you pray for one another and you encourage one another and you walk with one another through difficult times and When people say, where would I be if it were not for my brothers and sisters in Christ? That's part of the fellowship of the life of the church. But it's also about the worship of the church. We are to devote ourselves to worshiping God. Notice how it says that they devoted themselves. In other words, it wasn't just something perhaps that came naturally. You are naturally a worshiper. 
If you can imagine a, a fire hose with the water always on and you can't shut it off, you are always worshiping something. Every day, every moment, you're always worshiping something. The question is, is God the ultimate foundation for what you're worshiping in life? You've got to devote yourself to that as well. It's something that we intentionally devote ourselves to. We are called to worship God in spirit and truth. I want to invite you to join me in John chapter 4 for a moment. John chapter 4. And I know I led you astray on the last uh, field trip we took in the scriptures, but, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be the right one. This is Jesus. He's speaking with the woman at the well. And in John chapter 4, I'll start reading at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem, that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Listen to what Jesus says about worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. I want you to, I want to just point out a few things. Number one, there is such a thing as true worship. Which implies that there is such a thing as false worship where people deceive themselves into thinking that they are worshiping when in fact they are not, or they're not worshiping the one true God. There is true worship and there is false worship. God is seeking true worshipers. Notice what it says. It says God is seeking true worshipers. And then he says that worship consists of two things, that we worship in spirit and in truth. I want to take those in reverse order. Truth. What we sing matters. We can't just get up here and sing a bunch of songs that make us feel real good. Otherwise, we'd be singing a bunch of George Strait songs, okay? And we're not going to do that. They kind of get me fired up sometimes, but that, that wouldn't be a good worship song. Why? Well, I'm sure there's a lot of truth in a lot of them, but not necessarily God-driven songs, right? Gospel-driven songs. We want to sing songs that turn our mind's attention and our heart's affection to God, but we do that by speaking truth. It goes back to teaching. We are teaching even in our songs. And that's why some songs, if you realize it, you're talking to yourself. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. It's not just that you're talking to yourself, you're preaching to yourself. Because guess what? Your heart needs to be preached to every single day. And guess what? It's going to get it one way or the other. The question is, are you going to preach to it? Are you going to let Scripture preach to it? Are you going to let somebody else? Worship is intended to glorify God, but it does that as well through the edification of the church body. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. We must speak truth to God. But also it says worship in spirit. I believe that this is speaking of spirit-driven, Holy Spirit-empowered worship. That means that we're not going to look like we're sucking on a lemon while we're singing about the glories of Christ. That means that we're going to be moved by it. When your wife came down the aisle, you didn't look at her like, meh. You didn't say, I affirm the statement that she is beautiful and then just stand there cold face, did you? No. Like I ran out of room on my face to smile. Okay? I was so excited from the moment she walked through those doors all the way down. And I was emotional through the whole time. I'm going to start getting emotional now talking about it. But here's the point. God is immeasurably glorious and wonderful. And how on earth could we sing these songs about the creator of the universe and stand there cold-faced, stone-faced? 
without any emotion, without any movement in our heart. I'm not asking us all to, to turn into something that we're not, but I'm asking you to, be, to think about the fact that we should be moved by the greatness of God. And if we're not, then maybe you're not understanding the truth of who God is. Maybe you're pushing away from that. Maybe you're scared of that. Because for God to be on His throne in your heart, you've got to get off of it. Stop being so impressed with yourself. Start being impressed with the greatness of God who is the essence of everything that is good, true, and beautiful. Be moved by Him and then proclaim truth back to Him. That's what you were created for. One of the core ministries of the church is worship to others. And we'll move quicker. Service. In Acts chapter 2 it says that they sold their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as they had need, enjoying the favor of all people. Let me ask you a question. You want to know one of the reasons Christianity has such credibility with me? Because I've reflected on the person of Jesus Christ. A lot of people, they, uh, when they reject Christianity, it's interesting because they'll run to an Old Testament story. They'll run to uh, something that happened in the history of the church. They'll run to their own history, something that happened in their own life that kind of pushed them away from God. And you're looking in the wrong place. You need to look to Jesus Christ. You look to Jesus Christ, you find a fault with Him, and you find something you think could be improved upon, then we've got a conversation to talk about. If you can come up with something, my office door is always open. You can come sit down we'll talk about it. But as I read the stories of who Jesus is and what He did, I am captivated by who He is. He is absolutely fascinating as an individual, as a person. And one of the things that fascinates me the most is that He's a King of kings. He's a Lord of lords. He is the one by whom all things exist in heaven and on earth. And He's the same one who will kneel down and wash the dirty feet of His disciples. You show me any other religion that can match that. You've got all the time you need. Jesus says, I came not to serve I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That ethic is seen in the life of the church as they served one another. They gave their stuff away so they could get money and they could give it back to help those in need. That was the ethic of the early church. It's what they did. It's how they lived their life. And that should be reflected in the ministry of this church as well. That's why, for example, a couple of times a month we've got this food pantry. We can always improve. We can always get better. But that's the core ministry that we need to be focused on. One of the core ministries that we need to be focused on. Interesting historical side note. You know, humility was not viewed as a positive virtue really until Christianity took off. Boasting was always seen as something virtuous back in those days. It's interesting. uh, My wife teaches uh, English among other things, and they went over this book called Beowulf, and this, I think, was written after the time of Christ. But, but as one of her assignments, she had them write out boast of themselves because that's what the character did. And I'm not going to get too deep into it because I'd, run, I'd outrun my coverage real quick. But that was seen as a good thing back then to be boastful, to be prideful. Jesus turned that on its head when he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then I just want to read this to you, and then we'll go to the last uh, ministry, and then we'll conclude this morning. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, listen to what Jesus says, how he turns all of this on its head. He says in Matthew 20, verse 20, The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your kingdom. She was convinced he was a king. He was going to be king. She wanted her sons to have a good seat at the table. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers, probably because they had the idea before the rest of them did. 
verse 25. But Jesus called to them, called them to him and said, You know the listen to this, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever must be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is a God that we serve. This is the Messiah that we follow. And that brings us to our final ministry of the church, evangelism. And the Lord added to their number, it says, day by day, those who are being saved. I like something John Hammett said. He says, the ministry of teaching involves an explanation and a defense of the gospel. Genuine Christian fellowship portrays the power of the gospel in human relationships and has long been one of the most effective means of drawing people to faith in Christ. The gospel is central in Christian worship and service makes the love of God described in the gospel manifest in human life. He actually doesn't give an evangelistic program there. He just says that the power of all of these things amounts to the fact that people were added to their number day by day. We are to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are called to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ as you go out into the world and proclaim the ministry and, and proclaim the message of reconciliation. And people hear that message. And what we saw last week on the screen was pretty amazing because that message going out into the world, not by sword, not by violence, that message going out, the power of the gospel going out, is changing hearts and lives around the world and people are being brought into the family of the king. They're being brought into God's kingdom in a way that's not violent. You're not forcing anybody. You're just proclaiming the glories of Christ and the Spirit moves on their heart and they come to Christ. That is power, folks. And that is a message that you have. That's a message that I have to carry out into the world. And our, my question is, are you doing it as an individual but our question this morning is, are we doing it as a church? Are we taking that message to the world to show the world the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Maybe you're here this morning. I just want to invite you, if, if you've never taken a step to trust in Christ, this morning I, I invite you to do so. The gospel is to be obeyed. It's not a suggestion. It's, it's something that is to be obeyed. And so I wonder if, if you've ever repented of your sins and trusted in Christ and know this God that we proclaim this morning. Maybe you're not part of a church home. I invite you to come be a part of something that's truly significant, that really does matter, that really does make a difference in the hearts of people in this area and around the world. Not just because you want to be a part of this organization, but because you want to be a part of the body of Christ and the movement of God. Gracious Father, I pray today as we are gathered here that we would know that this is not just some abstract theology. This is flesh and blood. This is real life, what we're talking about this morning. So God, change our hearts. Draw us to yourself. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. The altar's open. Whatever God leads you to do this morning, pray that you would respond as we close in worship.
Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming this morning. Uh, Brother Kyle's going to come share some announcements with us. I know one of those is going to be to invite uh, you down there to uh, join with us as we just fellowship with, and that way you have a personal opportunity to thank uh, any first responders we might have with us. All their meal and their family is absolutely free. So, Brother Kyle, share with us, brother. I'd like to invite you down to uh, the fellowship to... Uh... <laughs> Meal free, yeah, so we got it. Very nice. I like it. Partnership right there. Uh, a couple quick announcements for this evening. Um, we have both a men's and a women's study going on this evening. Uh, the, the Women's Thrive Study will continue in their first Peter. Uh, the men, we will be beginning our book study just on chapter one. If you haven't read it, no problem. Not a big deal. I've read it. I do a lot of talking. I talk for all of us. Um, so, but uh, we're going to have a, a great, why are you guys laughing so hard at that? Um, we're going to have a great discussion uh, regardless. It's a fantastic book uh, by J.D. Greer called Not God Enough. So uh, hopefully you'll join us. Um, uh, I'm not real sure where everybody's going to be. Uh, I think the women will probably be in the fellowship hall. Men will be in 308. Um, if not, guys, if you show up and there's a bunch of ladies in the room, move to the other room, okay? Um, that's not your study. Um, have a, we have a special called business meeting uh, Wednesday, September 19th. So this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Uh, so please join us for that, um, for the, the children's minister search team, um, uh, for the approval of that. So, so please join us and stick around. Uh, we've got our Wednesdays in full swing, so you can come at five o'clock for our, for, uh, dinner. Uh, then we have the, the business meeting, bring your kiddos. We've got, uh, children, we've got youth, we've got all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, and we're having a great time with that. So please bring the young ones and then stick around. Jared is doing a study, uh, called knowing God. Uh, it's been, uh, uh very fruitful. And then um, next week, next week we have our evening of discipleship with uh, Man Church, uh, and, and the ladies will continue theirs, their, theirs and thrive, and the kiddos will be doing children's church again, Matt? Matt? Yes, yes, kiddos will be doing children's church over in the youth room, and there will be food for, for uh, uh, everyone that's here. Uh, so really excited about that, so please join us next week for that as well. Um, and then Matt, I think I, I'm done. Matt, you got one for me. Hey, everybody, how many of you guys argue with your spouse? Just go ahead and raise your hand. If you don't, you're probably not married. Okay, so <laughs> we have a special opportunity. It's called Reunite. It's a marriage study. Uh, we're going to start doing that Thursday night, September 20th through November 8th, 6.30 and onward. It's going to be kind of like a potluck style. Child care is going to be provided. So I would encourage you, if you're married... Come to this. Um, it's going to be a fun event. There's going to be a lot of chance to socialize and to get to know each other. Um, and it's not just for veterans, but it kind of comes out of the veteran, um, the veteran reunite process with your spouse when they come back from deployment is where the idea came from, but it's for everybody. So please RSVP. Um, we need to know how many booklets to provide. So there's a link right there. Or you can just email me or tell the office, but just let us know. Or tell Kyle Merrick is also, he should be in your bulletin. Um, so those are the ways you can contact and sign up, but please do that. Because it starts on Thursday, we're printing booklets Monday, and so it's free, but we need to know how many people are going to be there. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Silas, for that uh, announcement. All right, I got some good news today, and uh, so uh, Miss Marcine Chambers, if you would come on up here and stand with me. This is uh, Marcine Chambers, and she wants to join our church today by a letter from a sister church, and so if you rejoice with her decision, say amen. 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 Gr glad to have you. Yeah, go ahead and give God some glory. Praise God. <laughs> okay, and this is Jeannie Richards. Is that correct? Is that, I say it right? Okay. Okay, no, no S, just Richard. And uh, so she's here today as well to join our church uh, from Sister Church. So if you uh, rejoice, say amen. 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 Praise God for her. Come run over here and stand. And then Miss Carla Rowe, if you would come on up here. And this is uh, Mike McMillian's sister who's been with us a little while. And so we are thankful that she's coming to join today uh, by a letter from a Sister Church. So if you rejoice, say amen. 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 Praise God. So after the service, please come welcome them into our fellowship, and we'll be good to go. Uh, why don't we, I think we should bless the food before we leave, and that way when people get down there, they can just dive in. How could about that? that? Could do that. So, Brother Daryl, you want to take care of that? To. I was just going to point out, these three great ladies up here have already joined the choir. 
<laughs> Brother Jerry, did you notice that? So anyway, we're glad they're here. Let's do, would you stand together? Let's, and there is plenty of food down there. So even if you didn't sign up, I've, there, Sean Rhodes has been cooking all night. So uh, stay with us. And first responders, we're so glad you're here. And it's our treat to, to treat you this way. So you guys go first through the line. Let's pray together. And then we're going to close up with hallelujah. Um, all I have is Christ. I just went blank. Let's pray. Father, you are great. It has been good to be in your presence this morning. We thank you for church. And you've called us together. Father, what would we do without it? We give you praise today. We thank you for the meal that we share together. We thank you for providing it for those that have labored over it. We pray to bless it to our bodies. We thank you for these first responders that we honor today. Bless their lives and their families. Watch over them. Protect them as they serve us. Father, you are great. All we have is in you. In your great name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.